Um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you because you are me and we are us and we are here together. Because the journey towards health and health care needs everyone involved in it. It is not an option. It is not a choice. It is not even a negotiation. It is essential. We are all on this journey together and not everyone realizes they're on the same journey and they're going in the same direction. Now, Dr. Anderson mentioned the fact that the National Library of Medicine is here to help you because after all, I am from the government and I'm here. <laughs> but we are not, we are you and you are us, you pay us. And so I'm here to say, tell me what you need so I can bring that to you. Now, the reason, the reason why I need to hear it from this community is because I hear it a lot from the professional community and the biomedical researchers, and they are an important constituency. But today, and fundamentally in my whole career, we listen to the person who is at the intersection of living and care. So picture this diagram here, the line being a period in the life of an individual. So this person happens to have had a traumatic injury, fractured soldier, shoulder, has surgery, has recovery, gets counseling, goes home on medications, hopefully not opioids, has a good physical therapy and a good outcome. And at the end of most medical care, most people are better. Even if the end comes a lot longer than Doug's trajectory. If you watch the best of Doug and I will tell you, you know that if it's not right, maybe the end hasn't happened yet. But we do know that the skinny little lines is where people think all the action in healthcare is. At the doctor's office, at the clinic, in the imaging place. But I know, and you know, that it's between those spaces, in the care between the care, where people live with health challenges every single day. And the National Library of Medicine must go to where the care happens, not just the institutions that give it, but everyone. So I wanna introduce you briefly to some ideas about how the National Library of Medicine supports the care between the care and what we're gonna be doing in the next couple of years. You're very familiar with most of our wonderful, amazing products that are direct to the consumer, as my friend Michael would say, are designed for the lay user. But I, we understand and we know that of the five million hits to PubMed every single day, every single day, that two thirds of them are from people who would not identify themselves as professionals. So we are getting, we are reaching, even with our professional services, people who need our information, and we need to continue to do that. Our Medline Plus resource is specifically targeted towards individuals who have health concerns and who use a vernacular of health information that is different than health professionals. But I would submit to you that PubMed and PubMed Central get used just as much. So clinicaltrials.gov is, is that's likely to be used by a family member looking for a trial for a seriously ill person as it is by a drug company. And we recognize and we are committed to serving science and society. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on with PubMed and PubMed Central. PubMed, as you know, our literature database is, now has over 27 million citations. It gets two new citations every minute. In the last 40 minutes, you've been sitting here having your coffee and talking, 80 new citations are in there. Go home and start reading fast. That's all I can tell you. That's all I can offer you today. But I need to offer you something more because first of all, at home, there may be a complicated family situation. There may be a job that has to be done. There may not be resources like no internet. How do we serve these resources to individuals? We must do that through partnerships, particularly through partnerships in the commercial sector who can bring our resources out to everyone. PubMed Central is a specialized part of our data resources that have full text articles, five million full text articles. Every NIH funded study in the last eight years now is in this. We have five million articles. Half of them are available for full text processing, that is natural language processing. All of them can be read. We are committed to growing this. But we are also committed, importantly, to making important additions to PubMed to make it even more useful to people. So effective October of, of 17 and now fully formed in October of 18, the researchers can attach data sets directly to a PubMed Central article so you can download the data they used in their studies and examine it and explore it. We require the researchers follow the level of protection that was agreed to with the participants, but data are available and are increasingly available. 
In addition, we're experimenting. We're going to be creating PubMed 2.0. We've been releasing it about two years. So we have something now called PubMed Labs. If you haven't seen it yet, just Google PubMed Labs and you'll find it. This is our experimental site where we're trying out all sorts of new things. See in the lower right hand corner where it says feedback. Once you try it out, please tell us what you think of it and tell us who you are so we understand and so our engineers understand the breadth of people we're trying to reach. Now here's two things that are happening in PubMed Labs that are really kind of cool. One of them is we recognize that 80% of the people who do a PubMed search never go to the second page. Now that's probably not the people in this room, but 80% of the people who hit our website, do a search, get 237,000 results in that search, only read the first 20. So if you want the good stuff, you've got to get to the first page. We've switched, we have now two options. A, if you will, chronolog reverse chronological ordering, which is what you're used to seeing, most recent articles first, and something called relevance-based ranking. Relevance-based ranking, you see the, uh, the, the right-hand side just below the word search. Uh, best results, uh, best match or most recent. Best match is relevance-based ranking. It's done through a machine learning algorithm that takes in a thousand different characteristics that we know over the whole searching of the database, but adds your special verbs, your special words to get what's most relevant to you. Secondly, we're providing snippets with each citation. So it's not just the citation, you have to click, read, no, I don't want that, go to the next one, click, read, no, I don't want that. We put a couple of phrases from this abstract that match the words of the, of the search so that you know right away what's available to you. This is free and open. This is available and will continue to be available with high quality research and high quality resources. But let me tell you a little bit about the research we do that's also designed to help the care between the care. We use, make computational approaches to improve the public health. And the first one I want to talk to you about is pathogen detection. Every day we hear in the news, listeria or E. coli or something's bad in the apples. How do we figure out what that is? Well, what happens is we have a pathogen detection system where we partner with local public health authorities. A sample is taken from the food, from the environment, from a person. It's submitted to our vast genomic databases at NCBI. Pathogens are identified, and this happens within a 24-hour period because we have a, a we, we switch the way we do the search from finding every possible variant to classifying variants, so it becomes a classification scheme, not a sequencing scheme. We uncover the potential source of contamination. We work with the FDA. If action is needed, the FDA takes it. We're not able to take regulatory action. This happens almost 100,000 times a year. So every day this is happening, even as we sit right now. In the background, it doesn't really show up except the public health authority is better supported and the care between the care is achieved because we're able to get information back into the supermarkets, into the school lunch boxes, into the community so we know how to be responsive and supportive. Another problem I want to talk to you about that we're applying deep learning to is the challenge of cervical cancer screening. This is a leading cause of cancer mortality in low resource settings. And one of the biggest problems is having enough clinicians to be able to interpret a colposcopy exam. This is an, a picture of a cervix. This is what a, an examiner would see when they use a speculum to investigate the interior vaginal area of a woman. When this determining uh, whether or not a person is at risk or starting to show signs of cervical cancer is done through a pretty simple test of putting vinegar, acetic acid, in the area and looking for white spots. But interpreting this has been a challenge, and yet we build a machine learning algorithm that actually outperforms clinicians, outperforms human readers in being able to interpret whether or not a person is at risk for cervical cancer. Why is this important? How does it support the care between the care? Because now community workers can help with women's exam. Women can do a self-examination and send an image to have it interpreted, therefore reaching the low resource areas that maybe don't have an internet, don't have running water. We are able to provide the National Library of Medicine resources. We're also fostering discovery from health data. You may, because of the development in Boston area by Jonathan Brownstein, know about flu near you, and evidence surveillance in real time that takes advantage of Twitter, of purchasing processes, and of activities and choices, including reports from electronic, from, uh, excuse me, uh, emergency rooms. But why, how this becomes support for the care between the care is the information is immediately provided on the website. It can be viewed by anyone. We have democratized infection control to get the information back out so individuals can understand this. Another series of studies that's going on in, in, at the University of Pennsylvania, Graciela gonzalez Fernandez is trying to look at tweets as an indicator of, of substance abuse, particularly prescription medication abuse. Now she's not trying to surveil individual patients, but they're looking for pockets for behaviors to better understand how to target public health activities. 
what her work does, and by the way, I know I've got my Philadelphia voice on and I'm going really fast. Mark Daniel have all my slides. You can be interested in the Church of Legion. You can reuse them because, after all, you pay for them. Dr. Covington, this is what Graciela's group does. Medication selection. So she tries to understand first what is how there are different ways we call this medication, both formal names and informal names, and starts to look at the tweets to be able to take it as a whole set of unfettered natural language data and then processes them through annotation and supervised classification to begin to detect prior to an ER or a number of first responder calls, are there regions that are developing more risk of substance use, particularly prescription drug substance use. The challenge here, reaching into the care between the care without requiring an individual to be identified. Because as you know, very few times as an individual in a health crisis situation, say, by the way, I'm right here. We directly responded to that, John pointed out the issue that the, the challenge of becoming identified is an important, and we want people to do this. We're not suggesting anonymized care is good, but we can't ignore the care that we could be giving in anonymous ways. Let me close by talking about the National Library of Medicine's strategic plan. I'm extremely proud of this and completely committed to making this become a reality. The National Library of Medicine impaneled over 100 professionals and lay people into panels for discussions over a year and a half, and then got sought commentary by over, from over 1,000 people on where are we going in the future. And we heard many things. We heard, most importantly, the library that served the ICU in 1995 is not going to serve the family or the community in 2025, and we must build to 2025. We have three pillars for our future. Accelerate discovery and advanced health through data-driven research. Second, to reach more people in more ways through enhanced dissemination and engagement. And third, to foster a workforce for data-driven discovery, for, for, sorry, for data-driven research and health. We are committed to doing and creating what we call an ecosphere of discovery, where there will be linkages between articles and data sets and protocols and models and research, uh, I'm sorry, funding patterns and the computer code built to make the analytical tools work. Right now, you can only enter the research system through the literature. We want to let you enter it anywhere. The sweet spot of a library is building the arcs between these areas and putting structure underneath each one. We are committed to creating the 21st century collections, which will have innovative attribution, not simply professional definitions. Innovative attribution, so contributions from lay people become part of this. Automated curation, so we can return information possible to individuals. And finally, personalized delivery and presentation. Personalized presentation. How many of you are have a Mayan CBI account? Any of you? You can get personalized searches delivered back to you. We're in, we're to but you still have to be able to read in English and for a long period of time at a computer. So we're trying to find other ways to get our information out, make it more actionable. But notice those three words, collect, connect, and know. The library of the future is not going to hold everything as the custodian. It's also going to become an interconnected network to what's relevant and have increased discovery power to what needs to be known. We have training for workforce development, obviously for professionals is very important, but we also recognize that lay people are a part of the data revolution. And so we are opening our data resources to citizen scientists, to lay people. We're opening our training. We have a new research initiative called Personal Health Libraries to build data science tools for the lay person so we can get the power of data into the hands of individuals. Let me close by saying to you, you have my absolute commitment to work every day as strongly as I can to ensure that the National Library of Medicine remains a trusted, comprehensive, and accurate source of health information. I thank you very much for your time. I thank you for what you're doing, and you can reach me and talk to me anytime you'd like. Thank you.